is a novel you need to read. Hello, everybody, welcome to the conversation. I'm David Schuster. If you're like me and you like novels that are about other countries and America's relationship with them, particularly our adversaries, you're gonna love this one. It's a new novel, it's called The World We Wish. It's by John Moody, he's been a lifetime journalist. He was an executive for 22 years at Fox News, full disclosure. Back in 1996, John hired me to Fox News and I was there for a couple of years. We had a whale of a time and then we all decided it was probably good for me to leave Fox News. But that was 20 years ago and I've always maintained my respect and admiration for John. John, congratulations on this book, this novel. It's the sequel to a novel that came out about China called Of Course They Knew, Of Course They dot dot dot. That was about uh, the beginnings of the pandemic. This one is about artificial intelligence. Explain why. Well, David, first of all, the uh, the, the respect is mutual, and thanks for having me back on. Sure. Um, David, China has such a huge advantage over the rest of the world, including the United States, in the research and application of artificial intelligence that it really bore scrutiny, and that's what this book is about. Um, I, I fear that. Because artificial intelligence is just a, 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 a term that we throw around now without really knowing what it entails, that we're missing the, the danger of letting China get so far ahead of us. And you tell this story, this novel through fictional characters, but based on sort of real world events. Is there an architect of China's artificial intelligence program? And is it that person's or the government's mission to conquer the metaverse, as you put it? The answer is yes to both questions, David. There certainly is a head of China's artificial intelligence program. It's not the name that I used in the book, of course. And the specific stated reason for that position and that that entity is stated by the Communist Party quite openly to become the world's leading source of artificial intelligence applications and to use it for the betterment and and goodness of the party. And for the goodness of the party, that means their ability to essentially track through artificial intelligence, literally the movements of all of their people and to essentially put down people who may be dissidents. And that technology, that ability to track helps them with their sort of goal of worldwide communism with Chinese characteristics. That's exactly right, David, couldn't have put it better. Look, they they don't just want to control their own people. They don't just want to follow them. They wanna follow everybody in the world. And I know that sounds ludicrous, but it is not with it is not beyond their capabilities to install applications and software in the the um, tools that we all use that are made in China. And what we never look for is in the in the software of it, you know, what's in there that we don't understand, and how is it all getting back to China as quickly as it does? Let me give you one one quick example: sure. the the uh, door monitors and cameras that we all put into our houses now for very good reasons to avoid crime and to see who's in, you know, knocking at the door, etc. Most of those are made in China, and most of that um, history, that recorded history on our uh, door answering machines, goes to China. And what does China then do with something like that in a, in a worst case scenario? Right now, nothing, they just store it because the Chinese don't think in terms of news cycles like you and I did when we were at Fox. They think in terms of 40 and 50 and 100 years and they'll have that, that material, they'll have that information. Who knocked on your door or who rang your doorbell at 4.30 yesterday afternoon? And you know if it's someone that you didn't really want other people to know was answering, coming to your door, they know that too, and so there'll be a time when they decide to use it. And that's when Americans have to understand what they're doing when they use Chinese made products. And so there's the potential, I suppose, for blackmail for anybody, but particularly I suppose for our government leaders or our future leaders, they may have, the Chinese may have something on them. And what does China ultimately expect? I mean, is it a sort of a 40 or 50 year plan in terms of how this plays out? I, I believe it is, David. I, I think they have a shorter range objective, and that involves the so-called metaverse. Uh, you know, it's another one of those terms that we're not quite sure what it means. Does it just mean you know you put something on your head and you can slay dragons with a with a lightsaber, or is it is it more than that? And of course, we're being told by by the head of Meta, the former Facebook, uh, that someday we will all live our lives, I'm gonna emphasize that, live our lives in the metaverse. That's a very chilling statement. Well, John, you get at these issues with a really compelling narrative and the same sort of cast of characters that you had in your first novel. Uh, tell me a little bit about more and sort of their development. 
Yeah, uh, one of the problems with being an author is you fall in love with your own characters. And I thought that both of the characters that I've taken forward in this book um, were interesting enough and that their interactions were interesting enough. And the things that they believed and taught each other were interesting enough to, to uh, validate a, a sequel. Now, in, in this sequel, I am moving my characters from just the idea of artificial intelligence into another new era product, which is called the metaverse. Um, a lot of people don't know what the metaverse is. They think it just means putting on a headset over your eyes and around your head, and you get put into a, a, a fake uh, setting where you know you're you're slaying dragons with a lightsaber, uh, and it's just a game. Uh, it can be a lot more than that, and it is very quickly developing into more than that. Um, we're being told by the head of Meta, Mark Zuckerberg, that someday we literally, and he means it literally, will live our entire lives in the metaverse. And we got a taste of that during the pandemic where we're all essentially meeting through Zooms and remote. And essentially now there's gonna be this ability, imagine that times you know, a thousand in terms of the experience. Um, but the danger of course is that there's, there's data with all of that, right? Everything that you do and even think when you're in the metaverse is transmitted to the maker of that program. And China is by far the leading provider of these programs. Now I can understand why China has the impulse to sort of be uh, such a leader in all this, but how come the United States has fallen so far behind? Is it because of policy? Is it because our leaders are not paying attention? Or maybe they, they don't understand it? I, I, David, I, I really think, and this is a nonpartisan complaint on my part. I really think that our political leaders just don't want to spend the time and effort that it takes to understand the depth of the issues about artificial intelligence and leading on from that the metaverse. They are, they're more interested in making points about patriotism and, and this and that, uh, which is not, not inconsiderable. But you also have to be smart enough and broad thinking enough to take in all the problems. And truly um, our future is, is lagging behind that of China when it comes to this technology. When we last had you on, you pointed out that the power of China is growing while it's sort of essentially diminishing among Western powers and that China is slowly essentially crushing us. What have you seen over the last year that gives you the greatest pause? I think the same thing that you saw a couple of weeks ago, Xi Jinping, the maximum leader of China being given an unprecedented third five year term. And believe me, he is now as powerful as Mao Zedong ever was. Uh, he is as powerful as Joseph Stalin ever was in the Soviet Union. And, and this guy has big plans and they include taking over Taiwan by force or by diplomacy uh, and bringing the Western world, most especially the United States to heal. And so that as you pointed out earlier, uh, we all live in socialism with Chinese characteristics. How much of China's ambitions for Taiwan have perhaps been put on hold or altered because of Russia's war in Ukraine and what the world response has been to that? I think I think by by a certain number of, of months, possibly a year, but Xi Jinping is watching very carefully. Um, he probably thinks that his armed forces are far superior to those of Russia, and he might be right. Uh, and he also is looking to see how the West in general, I don't mean just the United States, but the West responds <coughs> to more <coughs> and more threats, <coughs> excuse me, against Taiwan. And when he sees what the West has failed to do in response to the invasion of Ukraine, he's got to feel pretty good about his chances. Your novel, in addition to being a great read and of course bringing up all these challenges that the United States faces, um, it comes at a time when it seems like our politics seems even more hopelessly sort of deadlocked and the partisanship and the extremes seem to be growing. Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic that to the US political system that we have the ability to somehow come together and at least try to address some of these issues? Or should we just sort of forget about it and get used to the idea that no, we are always going to be behind China and we have to prepare for the day when China uses all of this data to, to dominate the United States in some capacity. Well, I don't think it's inevitable, David, but I think that it's very possible that we will fall behind them permanently. Uh, they plan ahead. They don't have opinion, uh, different opinions from different political parties. They don't have the endless back and forth bantering that we have in Washington. Because if you say no to Xi Jinping, you're likely not to be around tomorrow. 
Um, some people might think that that's not a bad idea, but uh, but the United States just simply can't do it that way. That's not who we are. I, I think that we can always we can always call on the American spirit. We can always call on American ideals, but we have to do it as one people. It's no good doing it in in divided fashion and blaming everybody else for what's going on. And uh, speaking of people, we have a number of people at uh, the Young Turks who reside in Pittsburgh, including our publishing team. And the main character in your novel, I believe his name is Henry, he hails from Pittsburgh and you have some connections to Pittsburgh. And so uh, there's a third novel also involving Henry that's in the works. I, I, I'll, you, you've heard it here first, folks. Yes, there's a third one coming. It'll be the, uh, the final part of the trilogy and it will resolve a lot of issues while raising others. Well, if there's anybody who's gonna be a heroine and save all of us from all of these dastardly, dastardly conflicts that we face, of course it's gonna be somebody from Pittsburgh. So in any case, the novel is World We Wish. It's by John Moody. This is the sequel to the previous novel. Of course they knew, of course they dot, dot, dot. The World We Wish is about artificial intelligence and the metaverse and the challenge from China. John, always great having you on the program. Let us know when the third one comes out. We'll have you right back on to talk about that one. You'll be the first to know, David, thank you. All right, thank you. Welcome back to the conversation, everybody. I'm David Schuster, and I've got another great book for you to read. It's called From Scratch. It's a book about sort of where food comes from, not only the compelling interconnectedness of the supply chain, but also where the food itself is sort of produced and harvested. But this isn't just a book about food or about the journey through the infrastructure that helps produce it. It's a remarkable story told by somebody who's an incredible storyteller. David Moscow is an actor, he is a writer, show host, also the author. Some folks may remember him from his acting days when he was in the movie Big playing the young Tom Hanks. We'll talk about that in a second. But David, where did you develop this love of food and traveling to discover it? Wow, well, I love to eat. My mom is an incredible <laughs> uh, cook growing up and I was sort of her sous chef. Um, and then I had this epiphany, um, it was actually around the 2016 election and I was sitting in a Korean uh, barbecue joint out here in LA and I, I looked back into the back of the kitchen and there were um, there was a Mexican guy making food and I thought about how important Central Americans are they're the backbone of American food industry. And it was pretty crazy that the Republicans were going after and demonizing sort of particularly Mexicans, but immigrants. And I said, you know, it'd be cool is to make a documentary about how tacos are made and how margaritas are made, right? Margaritas are the number one cocktail in America and tacos are second or third in the fast food world. And, and I just thought that it would be really neat to go to Oaxaca and work with subsistence corn farmers, make masa, make its taco, and then show the hard work that goes on behind the scenes and how we're all sort of tied through food. And then that, you know, you in in Hollywood you have dreams of movies and that gets shelved, but it turned into a television show called From Scratch that was on A and E channel, our history channel, and then and then it a book came out of it, and the book was. When you're doing something on cable, you don't necessarily always get a chance to ask really deep questions. And when you run mm -hmm. into some interesting things, you kind of have to put them to the side. And and a book felt like a really neat place to do a deeper dive on some of these things. And that deeper dive talks includes sort of where things are going well in terms of food supply. And I was fascinated. You write about sort of the the oyster harvesting off of the coast of Long Island and how that's essentially making up or starting to make up for sort of the, the terrible situation that involves shellfish in the Mediterranean. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, you know, oysters collapsed, the oyster industry uh, in New York collapsed around you know the middle 1900s. Uh, the water became too polluted. Also, they were competing with, when refrigerated train cars came around, you could then transport cattle and it was a lot cheaper to raise 500 pounds of protein than the three years it took to raise three ounces of protein. So the oysters kind of got shelved. And um, but since pollution has started to reverse, um, and we realize uh, uh, there's a lot of health benefits with oysters, zinc, particularly you know during COVID, oysters would have been an incredible uh, healthy alternative to to uh, Beef. Um, 
And also, they do a wonderful job of, uh, of cleaning the water themselves. So um, I talk about how the revitalization of the New York oyster is a, is a wonderful thing. There's a, a billion oyster project that's going on in New York Harbor, which they're hoping to, New York was the home of the greatest oysters in the world. I mean, people came from all over the world and they had these, they had oysters that were the size of babies. Mm -hmm. um, and when new immigrants came to America, they could actually feed themselves down at the shore for free. They would go down and harvest and, um, and hopefully this organization, uh, the Billion Oyster Project is going to bring that back, which will clean up New York Harbor as well. You travel you traveled uh, something like 20 countries. I was fascinated to, to read yeah. about you, uh, I guess, milking a water <laughs> buffalo to make yeah. a mozzarella for cheese uh, and yeah. pizza in, in Italy. Uh, was there anything about any of these experiences that, that surprised you or that stood out? Oh Yeah, I mean, every day is a, it's a bucket list. Every day you're like in awe of, um, of the work that these people, that, that the food producers do. I mean, the water buffalo, you know, I'm making mozzarella, uh, uh, buffalo mozzarella in Italy to make um, one of the best pizzas in the world is in Naples at Da Michele. And, um, and so what I do is I first go to the chef, we make the meal, and then I harvest all the ingredients and try and reproduce it. So I go to this water buffalo uh, farm and uh, and they have Mozart playing because the buffaloes produce more milk when listening, when <laughs> comfortable. And they have these like huge massage parlors for them that they can walk through. But traumatizingly, the best way to milk a water buffalo is to get right behind it, lift the tail, and and milk exactly where your face does not want to be. Um, but I managed. I came away unscathed and and made some incredible pizza. <laughs> Well, it's quite a sacrifice that you made for that. Yeah. Um, what, yeah. A lot of people are going to wonder about the, the impact of climate, the climate crisis, climate change. How has that affected what you saw? Well, that was one of the big things that you know we we were coming face to face with during the making of the show, and in the book, um, the book is called "From Scratch: Adventures in Harvesting, Hunting, Foraging, and Fishing on a Fragile Planet." Mm -hmm. And that really, um, you know, I started out looking at the ties that bind communities through food. It takes 61 people to make a pizza. So even if you think that you've done it all on your own, if you're eating a slice of pizza, you really haven't, right? So that was how I started. And then throughout the journey, I realized that food producers really are at the front lines of, of global climate change and, and social and ec the fights around social and economic justice. Um, we we're in the, the South China Sea, or we were shooting in the Philippines, so they call it the Philippine Sea. And we went out to get fish for patis, which is fish sauce. It's a foundational Philippine ingredient, Filipino ingredient. And we couldn't catch any fish. And I asked why. And you know, on the TV side, we we're like, oh my gosh, we're not gonna catch any fish. But I asked the, the fisherman why. And he said, we have to go out longer and further than we've ever had. I get one tenth of what my dad got, and my dad got one tenth of what his father got. And it turns out that the South China Sea has lost 70% of its fish in the last 20 years. And there's all this territorial dispute that's going on. I mean, China's building islands closer and closer to the Philippines to enlarge their territory, and it's all for fish. And unless people can reach across the territorial boundaries and say, I know you think this is yours and I think it's mine, but there's not gonna be any fish here unless we come up with a solution. Um, and you see that in the Mediterranean as well. There's 28 countries which has been hammering the, the Mediterranean for 10,000 years and it's empty. Um, we went to go harvest shellfish there. We went to look for octopus there. And uh, again and again, we walked away I mean, one of the things I have to do is if I don't get what the chef asked for, I have to, I bring them like a, a butternut squash and I say, hey, can we use this instead? Um, and that happened one too many times out there on the road.
David, I don't mean to get all Larry King like on you, but I gotta ask. I mean, you you hit it big when you're very young, as the young Tom Hanks and big. Um, I know that it can be challenging for a lot of people who have success early on in their life to either replicate that success or feel like they have to and find some sort of meaning later on. So the two questions out of this was, <laughs> how did you manage to do it? And secondly, what was it like working with Tom Hanks? Oh well, Tom is amazing. Um, he he took me and my friends out. I mean, the first time I met him, he was handed a, a, a video recorder and he took me and my friends out to the park and just recorded us playing. And then would be like, here's a ball, you try and stop him from getting the ball. And then he would record it and all of these things ended up entering into the movie. And and not even me, like when we're watching the film, I'll be like, that's Ernest that he's doing right there. Mm-hmm. Um, which who was my best friend at the time. Uh, so it was amazing, and and to have that be the first project, you know, um, when you're in sort of a classic like that, um, it just is a gift for your whole life. Um, you know, working in any career, I imagine for 30 years is you you have to find new things that keep it fresh, um, and so. I love creative people. I love to be at, I love to facilitate creators. So I started producing on the side. I started writing. And then, um, you know, when I, when I had my son, I wanted to find, I guess, more meaning in it. Um, you know, acting sometimes can be a selfish uh, uh, um, job. And I wanted to see, like, how I could leave something, how I could leave the world better. Um, for my kid and projects like this um, that that have a, a sort of meaning, a deeper meaning, I think became more important for me. Um, so is there a follow up to, to this particular project or are there other sort of genres you wanna explore that may be related to either you know climate crisis or just how sort of vulnerable we may all be? Yeah, we, we have a, um, so the television show, is going to have a spinoff. Um, this is about food. We walk back how food is made. The next one is going to be about home. So, if I have to make uh, a faucet, I am going to mine iron, smelt steel, make a mold. If I'm going to do the floor, I'll harvest bamboo and walk it all back. And again, we'll be looking at sort of the hard work um, that uh, our construction workers and, and the people who, who bring us materials. Um, I think as a city person who never knew how any of this stuff was done, um, again, I say I look in awe and and learning about sort of how things are made. Um, and we're gonna look at sort of the future, kind of we're gonna make sea plastic countertops. We're gonna try and do alternative uh, insulation. We're gonna look at things that were done in the past. We may have sheep wool insulation, uh, so it's just gonna be, you know, construction is the second worst um, polluter. Uh, so we'll try and see what, who's doing good things that we can learn from. Um, and then we're gonna write a book on that. Uh, David Moscow, the book is from scratch. Uh, and just, just I just want to add real quick, sorry. I co-wrote this with my father who was a writer <laughs> on the show. Um, John Moscow. So, well, congratulations to both of you, uh, not only on the book, but also on the successes that you've had. And to be able to find meaning when you've had such a remarkable career already, to find meaning in some of these new projects, particularly when you have kids, I, I know firsthand is, is so important and so valuable. David, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, David. And that'll do it for this conversation. On behalf of Gina Kim, Asher Cofield, Craig Lowry, and Bart Kyle, I'm David Schuster. Thanks for watching.